So hi, hi everybody, and welcome to um, to one of the last uh, parallel session of Edi 2020. Uh, welcome to the managing DDI session. We'll have three uh, nice presentations today. We'll have questions after each uh, presentation, and also if we have time, we'll have some questions at the end. Uh, just a quick note on the fact that uh, this webinar um, is recorded as we are on Zoom, Zoom webinar, so the conference is recorded as you have seen when, when you joined. If you want to ask questions, uh, you can raise your hand and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, give you the right to speak because you are muted now. And also do not hesitate to use the module Q&A. Uh, also, uh, you, you may have seen that you do not see the participants list. So, so please, say, uh, please do not hesitate to say hi in the chat. Some of you did uh, and it's very nice. Uh, and I think uh, that's about it. Yeah, I should also tell you that if you want to tweet, please uh, use the hashtag Eddie2020. Uh, and you may know that we have a Discord channel for informal communication. I'm going to, uh, to put uh, the link in the chat in just a second. So the first session of the, the first presentation of the session managing DDI, uh, Will be uh, will be done by my colleagues uh, Geneviève and Baptiste uh, from the Center for Social Political Data. Uh, Geneviève is the team leader of the Dig Digital Pro Projects team at the CDSB. She won't be speaking today, but she's available for questions. And Baptiste is a research engineer in computer science with a strong background in web technologies, with an expertise in user interface design, both on technical and ergonomic levels. He has a key role in the development of the Shock Web Panel sam Sample Service, working on components such as the Docker infrastructure and the Vue.js application fronted. He has been a major contributor in the institutional research data repository project, uh, data science point FR. Uh, so, Baptiste, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, so good afternoon uh, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, we will see how to customize the DDI compliant repository is uh, specifically Dataverse without needing to change its code. Uh, to explain how to do that, I will take the Data Sciences Pro project as an example, which is a Dataverse repository that suits our needs. Uh, we will focus on the customization of the metadata model, uh, multilingualism, and user interface. The CDSP has been in charge of uh, setting up a Dataverse uh, as an institutional research data repository for Sciences Po. After doing that, we migrated our data bank from Nestar to a dedicated collection in Dataverse. Uh, our objectives were to set up a CESDA metadata model compliant Dataverse repository and then migrate our, our metadata from Nestar. Uh, you can refer to Anina's presentation to learn more about this. Dataverse uh, allows, us, uh, allows uh, a modular approach to its metadata model. It makes um, use of metadata blocks that can be activated as needed. Uh, there are numbers of domain-specific blocks such as uh, geospatial, life sciences, and astronomy, and others. Uh, in our case, we activated the social sciences metadata section that contains multiple DDI fields. Uh, customizing a Dataverse or original metadata blocks involves modifying a tab-separated value file. Uh, with uh, a TSV file, you can add change or remove uh, fields. For example, you can add controlled vocabularies, change the name, description, display order, and so on for each field uh, of the repository. A TSV file uh, targets specific metadata blocks. And uh, the operation is done in several steps. 
first you you need to upload the modified TSV file using the native API. And once you, once you do that, uh, a Dataverse admin has to trigger a Solar index um, so that the latest metadata configuration is taken taken into account by the search engine. To go a little bit more into details, uh, here's how we processed our Nestar data bank to be aligned with the CMM uh, before being ingested by Dataverse. So we started by transforming uh, Nestar DDI 1.2 metadata files thanks to custom R script. Uh, this step produced uh, DDI 2.5 files and a separate CSV file for controlled vocabularies. Next step was to import each DDI 2.5 file into Dataverse to create a da data set filled and fill the metadata to get and get back a DOI. Uh, each DOI was then injected back in the corresponding DDI file. Uh, but because only the study level documentation is used by Dataverse, uh, this whole DDI 2.5 file with a DOI was finally deposited inside the dataset on Dataverse. So at this point, uh, we have a dataset with all the data uh, with all the Dataverse metadata fields, and also a complete DDI file available to download. This process involves several iterations and error handling loops that are not shown on the slide. Uh, so if you have any question, do not hesitate to ask them at the end of the presentation. However, there are some issues about the customization of the metadata model. Uh, adding metadata fields to the metadata model is quite easy, but this must be done early in the process since revisions require a specific request on underlying database database with the admin privileges. Further revision uh, should definitely be avoided because of its complexity and subsequent risk. There is a DDI import API, but some part of the metadata will not be imported if we customize the metadata model. Uh, some scripted fixes and additional iterations were needed in our case. And as we will see now, multilingualism uh, creates an additional layer of complexity. As an inst institutional repository, adding support for French language was part of the specification. Adding languages is possible from Dataverse version 4 onwards. If your, language is, uh, if your languages are already supported and if you don't have a custom uh, metadata model, the steps are quite straightforward. Uh, as explained in the Dataverse online documentation, you will need to declare new languages that will appear in the drop-down menu, and then upload a language bundle file using the translations that are maintained by the community. Uh, so feel free to contribute to complete missing translations and add uh, new languages. Uh, you can add translations for anything in Dataverse, even for custom metadata models. That means you can also translate control vocabularies, but you will need to do additional work. So let's take an example. In the metadata block uh, TSV file, if a self-administered questionnaire web-based is a control vocabulary item value for mode of collection, you will need to add uh, the following line in the language property file. Uh, you will have to be careful with the name of the property because the only name that will work is the name of the value in the TSV file for which we have to strip accents and also replace spaces with underscore. But you can see that uh, in the documentation. But it's a bit tedious to do that and there is a high risk of error if you do it manually. So in our case, we wrote a script that can first create uh, language property files for each language uh, and different metadata blocks we, ha we have, and then transform uh, TSV control vocabulary vo TSV control vocabulary values to property names, and then finally add the translated value to each property. 
And here's the result in our search, search engine. Some, translate, some translations are displayed, uh, displayed as intended. For example, you can see in the filters, uh, in the topic classification terms, which use, uh, uses a control vocabulary, that everything is trans translated in French and English. Uh, but there is still room for improvement in the way Dataverse follows the DDI schema. Uh, Dataverse cannot save metadata in multiple languages. Uh, as an example, it's not possible to save and display a title in more than one language. But there, there is a specific group in Dataverse uh, community that is actively working on having more flexible metadata. Uh, we will now see the custos customization possibilities with Dataverse for the user interface. With Dataverse, you can set up a landing page uh, and also a header and a footer. But uh, that, that, that was really useful for us as we could create a specific landing page that would provide a clear visual setup to help users navigate between different services. For example, we have a big red button to find and explore our data, and also uh, information to contact uh, data curators and also deposit data. Uh, and this uh, landing page is also available in French and English. You can also add a custom style sheet in Dataverse uh, to make it more consistent with your own design guidelines. Uh, in our case, we also wanted to add mod more white space and to place content in a way that would improve readability. Uh, this is another view that shows... Uh, but this is another sample with a tiny layer of Science Expo's favorite color, the red. And uh, if you are interested in using our landing page or style sheet, you can visit our GitHub and customize it for your needs. Overall, uh, this has been a long journey for us, but there are still remain some remaining issues that we are still working on. Uh, we are currently working, uh, collaborating with Dataverse on multilingualism issues and also uh, DDI compliance issues. Uh, you can check uh, these issues uh, on GitHub uh, by clicking the links. Thank you for joining this session. Do not hesitate to ask questions. Thank you, Baptiste. Uh, I don't see any... Uh, ah, I see a question or more a comment from Taina. Translating the DDI and CESDA vocabulary would be best done in the common vocabulary tool CESDA vocabulary service in order to avoid conflicting translation on the same code values. Now Dataverse can use the API uh, of this tool. Uh, do, do you want to comment uh, on this, Baptiste? Uh, yes. Should I? Okay. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the uh, the vocabulary API is not in the master branch of Dataverse. Uh, it's in another project. Uh, it's not uh, in the main branch yet, I think. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Geneviève has also. Yes, yeah. perhaps uh, I could uh, have some uh, answers about this. Uh, at the time uh, we starting, we started working on this. Uh, there was no. Uh, uh, says that vocabulary service API in uh, in production, so we were uh, uh, aware that uh, it would it would be soon released. So we uh, we make use uh, actually of uh, says that control vocabularies. We follow the the lines and the sources, but we. Uh, at the moment, we don't use this service, and uh, it's definitively a service that we want to uh, to include in our setup. So, uh, a timing issue there, but uh, no intention to uh, 
uh, to reinvent the wheel or to uh, to uh, to follow a separate uh, route from the CESTA vocabulary service. Yes, this is Taina. Yes, I, I think the Dataverse has only had this for two weeks or something, so it's understandable that during your project it's not available. Yes, and yeah. and furthermore, as uh, Baptiste uh, was uh, explaining, uh, this is done in a separate branch from Dataverse, and we are using uh, on purpose uh, the main branch of Dataverse. Uh, so uh, we will have, I think, uh, we will have to wait uh, until uh, this uh, adds on. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, put into the main branch of uh, Dataverse code base, but the, it's definitely useful and a, a route to follow, a way to go. Thank you. Um, I see there's another question in the chat. Uh, are there any resources or guidance available for converting DDI 1.2 Nestar into 2.5 Dataverse? So uh, in that case, I think maybe Alina has more information because it, it was part of the R script you, please, done please by answer. Alexander. Yeah, but please answer the, you can answer the questions is, is okay, it's okay. Uh, actually, don't. Uh... In fact, uh, sorry, it's, a, it's more <laughs> a question for me. It's, uh, uh, so uh, there's, um, if you go on the Zenodo, Zenodo collection of Eddy 2020, uh, you'll see uh, the presentation that I, I gave yesterday. Uh, we did this in two steps. Uh, first, we used an R script uh, to transform the XML DDI 1.2 to DDI 2.5, and we made it available on GitHub, and you'll find the link in the presentation. Uh, and afterwards, um, the IT team of the CDSP uh, used a Python script. Uh, every, everything is in the presentation, and also please do not hesitate to contact us uh, after uh, we, can, we can talk about it. Do we have any other questions? I see none. I, I had maybe just one question. What can you, you tell us, uh, Genevieve and Baptiste, about uh, the way uh, you collaborated with Dataverse, with the Dataverse team? Because I know you worked a lot with them uh, and with the community of Dataverse in general. Uh, I think the community is really great and really, um, how to say, they, they answer really fast and Reactive. are welcoming. Yeah. Uh, it's really nice to work with them. Uh, and Genevieve, do you have something to add? Um, I would uh, suggest that, uh, uh, I don't know how to say, say that, that we, uh, we uh, develop more uh, um, collab collaboration with uh, or that the European community would be more uh, part of the uh, Dataverse community because uh, it's, it's a benefit for all to, uh, to coordinate our efforts. I, I know there are several uh, uh, Dataverse repositories in Europe and uh, we are all facing uh, uh, more or less uh, the same issues and uh, we can benefit a lot from uh, efforts uh, made by others and uh, especially I would like I will provide uh, several links in the chat and there are um, kind of uh, uh, project uh, github uh, when where every uh, dataverse uh, instance in your um, in the in the world can uh, follow some uh, current uh, dataverse issues and uh, promote in a way uh, a dataverse issue that is relevant to its uh, uh, implementation so it's very interesting to look at what other already did and uh, what we can benefit from what would we can learn from that so thank you <laughs> <laughs> I see there 
uh, are no more questions and uh, so if it's okay with you we'll go on but before I'm going to do something that I never did before and I'm kind of taking advantage of the uh, chair position I have uh, just to say uh, that Baptiste was 19 when he began working at the CDSP and uh, I know that new adventures are waiting for him in 2021 after five years spent with us and I wanted to say uh, in the name of all of us at uh, Sciences Po, a huge thank you for everything. And uh, we are really, really proud of you, Baptiste. And uh, I hope you'll come to see us at EDI 2021, because once you, you begin dealing with EDI, you cannot get out this easily. Uh, so thank you. Thank and you, Anya. <laughs> I, I will come. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now let's move on uh, to the next presentation. Um, uh, it's a presentation um, from Wolfgang, by Wolfgang, who works at Gezis, the Leibniz, Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences in Germany. He has studied soci sociology and political science. He worked on several software developments for social science applications. And one of his main interests is to apply metadata standards such as DDI within the social sciences. So Wolfgang, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Alina. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen um, and get rid of this chat box here. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes, yes, we are. Okay. Just a moment. Okay. <clears throat> So my presentation is slightly more general than the previous one, but uh, maybe that makes it more interesting <clears throat> also to compare because I'm also talking about managing social science metadata, how we do that at the Data Archive at GESIS. So my, um, my presentation after a brief introduction <clears throat> will cover the challenges that I see currently um, coming up for metadata applications, how we face them, and how we manage the selection of standards that we use for the metadata, and also how we do conversions between uh, the different standards and um, how we serve the exchange of metadata that is taking place. Then I will go quickly into some small uh, applications and show you the current state of workflows, how we apply this um, at the moment. And then I have some conclusions for you. So um, as you might know, the, the GESIS data archive has more or less uh, a lot of surveys. Um, and these surveys are covering mostly Germany, but also other European countries. And they cover all the typical topics that we have in sociology and political science. I have uh, printed on the slides some, some of the um, categories uh, about political behavior, government issues, elections, but we also have topics like economic uh, topics and media topics covered. And <clears throat> these are all part uh, of our data collections that you see on the top right. Uh, we have the, the GESIS DBK, which is the abbreviation for the data catalog. We also have Suvidata Datorium, and this is our um, self-archiving repository and also used for the, as an institutional repository, collaborating with uh, journals, for example. And then we have GESIS MISI, which is a special case because we don't have the data there. It's official micro data. Uh, but we have the metadata. And um, so what we experience is that the data are coming more and more from different um, types uh, and also are in many more diverse data formats than we were used before. And the examples that we all know uh, are coming from the social media data area like Twitter or Facebook uh, content. Then we have a lot of geographic and information added also um, as linked data to the survey data. And 
we are experiencing, um, especially in the Sovi Data Nectatorium space, that people give us more free text information, that they uh, deposit some code which is intended for data preparation or data analysis, and also something like link collections. So this is much more than the typical survey data type that we experienced. And so what are the tasks that the data archive performs uh, currently? It's, uh, yes, we are creating study description. Even if we get the study description from principal investigators, we very often create additional content for, for this. Uh, our service is that people can have a data deposit and secondary users can also uh, access the data that we have in the archive. And we help researchers also to create simple documentation, but also more complex documentation in bigger projects like survey series that run over several years. Uh, also, we give uh, general advice uh, for projects for their research data management. And last but not least, we ensure that the long-term archiving is done for all these research data sets. So these user services have formerly been done more uh, often in very special purpose portals, like a, a specific application that is intended uh, for a smaller community, for example, something like historical statistics. So we had to have a separate portal and also uh, something like um, um, the European value study has a specific purpose portal, but we have uh, started now to integrate these services much more into our general purpose website. I, know I will show you in a minute what is going on here. So these challenges, um, they consist mainly uh, that we have higher amounts of data uh, and a wider vari variety of the data sets that we give. So this is not so much a problem if we face uh, just more of the same, because that's uh, meaning that we just need more uh, um, storage space. But um, also the context of the data collection and also the data analysis later on is much more interdisciplinary uh, than it was before. And this means that we also exchange, have more exchange of the existing data set in with different institutions and that we also increase, um, have increased data sets that are multilingual and also users expect us that we do a really fast uh, data provision and that they can access the data that is available very quickly. So, and this also implies that we need to comply to more standards that maybe are partly are also outside uh, the existing areas of the social sciences. Uh, for example, with the COVID pandemic, we are having more and more um, requests uh, from the health and medical sciences. And um, another example is that we have projects going on together with climate scientists uh, who are from the natural sciences and they work on something like tipping points uh, for the climate system. And this is being researched also from the social science perspective. Um, so um, how do we select the standards that we need for our data documentation? So uh, why do we uh, select? So we, the selection is a means to have a, a solid ground for, for building um, applications. And <clears throat> For these applications, you you need well-defined interfaces to exchange the data. And as we've seen uh, in the presentation before, uh, very often you have several steps that need to be undertaken. And so if you want to ensure the interoperability, uh, the selection must be really well-defined. So until now, we've been working on DDI lifecycle as the basis. We started with DDI codebook, but we wanted to make all our applications compatible to DDI lifecycle. But on, in the same time, we need to extend this and combine this with additional standards. And um, I will show you in a minute which uh, we selected for that. 
Um, technically, we currently manage this with the DDI FlatDB approach. This is a database technology uh, allowing us to store different flavors of DDI XML. And this has been presented by uh, my colleagues, Oliver, Peter, and Alexander. So, for example, what needs to come in addition to the DDI lifecycle? So the easy things are ISO standards for date, time and country, but also for languages, for example. And um, then for sure we need to use the CMM SESTA model, uh, which is a subset of DDI, so that's easy for us, but still has some additional considerations that we need to take into account. Um, for registering DUIs for our data set, we're using the service of DARA, the German da Data Registration Agency, um, uh, which is part of the data site community. And for this, we need to fulfill also the requirements of the data site metadata schema. And all of those examples uh, include using controlled vocabularies, uh, which narrow down the options um, to, to use uh, specific values in certain metadata fields. So what we really need to do is to have a version management um, for, for all of those. So it's not only selecting and saying, okay, we're now using ISO standard, let's say ISO 31661 for countries, uh, for the nations, but they do also change over time. So we, the management needs, needs to reflect this and um, reflect also that metadata uh, schemata do change over time. And this is a challenge as well. So there are even more standards that are relevant to our work. So we want uh, that the data that we describe may be findable uh, on the web. And for this, for example, the semantic web technologies are relevant. Uh, you might be familiar with RDF and SCOS as um, examples for specific pur purposes within this world. Um, and what we need to ensure is that um, the metadata that is going into these formats uh, is uh, well aligned with the metadata that we have uh, in our DDI. Uh, also, something like schema.org, uh, which is used to extend your web pages that you have and annotate them with metadata, um, is very important to search engines. Then we are part of the European uh, science community and the open air um, community is using also additional standards like the CRIS system, which is common research information system and the data catalog vocabulary, uh, which is a standard by the W3C. And so um, to, to have um, a mapping into those relevant standards, we have the additional problems that um, depending on the application that serves this to the web, we have several of them. For example, our data catalog provides a mapping to schema.org. And then we have, uh, we provide the same metadata to DARA for the registration of the DOIs. And DARA also has a mapping to schema.org. And so the same data set may have different representations uh, on schema.org and the same might be true also for other semantic web things. And this creates an additional layer of complexity. And this is only for the basic metadata fields. Um, but then we have also uh, topic classifications that are really um, extending the metadata, metadata very much and make them usable and comparable to other uh, contents from other providers. And I have listed some, some of the relevant topic classifications that we're using. Um, the multilingual 
else to Thesaurus uh, will be used by the SESTA archives. Um, and we are planning to use the German Thesaurus Sozialwissenschaften, Thesots, uh, and do a mapping to provide this. So, and we still have the former uh, topic classifications from the Zentralarchiv ZA categories, the SESTA topic classification, and several uh, data collections that use continuity guides and so on. So um, this is uh, the universe of the metadata standards where we are in and creating these metadata standards um, has involved uh, really a lot of thinking, but as a user, you want not to um, think again for each of those metadata data standards. You want to uh, curate your metadata in one version and then have conversions so that you don't need to do that manually every time. So uh, this is called doing mappings or crosswalks. And what we have is um, we have created several mappings um, that can be done automatically. So um, that saves us a lot of time and effort and you can document it once and then publish it in many portals. Um, the problem here is that very often semantic meanings are really difficult to map. So um, not, not everything can be mapped uh, to everything else. And um, therefore we need um, to decide on which level of granularity the mapping uh, may take place and sometimes we are losing also some kind of information but it's still better to have a partly mapping that can be done automatically than have um, things that need to be done manually all the time and um, take considerable effort to be maintained. Um, now, uh, I would like to show some of the examples how we do that currently at the Gizes Data Archive. So the first example are the study descriptions that we have. So we are currently using the DBK Edit application, which is our data catalog internal editing tool, um, using an underlying MySQL database to store all the metadata. and. Um, I have a small screenshot, maybe I try to, to make this a bit larger so that you can get an impression. So it's just an easy web-based tool where you can edit titles and um, additional metadata like the versions and, and things like collection dates and so on. Uh, we maintain um, the metadata here in German and English as a standard and we use this to export it into DDI Codebook XML to feed the SESTA data catalog. And it's also exported into another flavor of DDI Codebook to feed our SACAT server, which is a nesta based system. And because they are formally different, we need to uh, maintain two different mappings here. Um, but also, since I said we want to go to DDI lifecycle, uh, we export this to the to the to our DDI flat DB, which is our central metadata store, so to say. And this is currently being used by the export data portal and also by the SESTA EQB, which are both in beta phase at the moment. Um, but this is maybe the most rich representation of metadata for our study description. Then again, um, I already mentioned that we register the DUIs by the DARA system. And this uh, is a completely separate format where we need to export the metadata. But it's best practice if you register DUIs that you also fulfill the metadata requirements and the, the data site metadata schema might be very generic, but the DARA system uh, is a more um, detailed metadata system um, with social, social science information and we export it from here also. And then we have our GESIS search system on our website and 
for years for this we also have a solar search index and this is supplied to the Gezes search and um, maybe just a short glimpse on this this is how the same uh, study looks um, displayed in our Gezes search so uh, it's different representations but it's all the same metadata and um, this is how we currently uh, go for the study description. Another example um, is the variable and question documentation. And I'm trying to be quick here um, because this is much more complex and we could talk uh, for this uh, topic much more in detail a longer time. We also have an application called Dataset Documentation Manager. Um, which is uh, saving the data in a Microsoft Access database. It looks like this. And we are having a study here with all the variables and the variables have labels and have uh, codes. And we, we can attach questions and sub questions and also general remarks here. And this is all combined into a, a variable documentation like this. And um, we export this uh, to our Codebook Explorer application to create PDF variable reports, but also we create DDI Codebook export for our SACAT server, the Nesta server again, uh, combines this with the study description. And we also export the DDI lifecycle for our DDI FlatDB, and again, used by Explore Data and Chester EQB and will be used in the future also by the Gezes search. So this is an example of the current Chester EQB application. Two more minutes where, if possible. Yes, thank you for the hint. And this is um, showing the questions only because the EQB is based on questions, not on variables. So, but this is based on the DDI lifecycle. So a summary of this, um workflow is this picture i will not go into more detail with this but you can see we have already here implemented our common metadata store and we are feeding separate um, portals for the end users and we are now uh, in the situation that we want to make the DSDM documentation feeding into the Gezes search. And if we can get rid of some of those portals, we will um, be able to make it much easier for users uh, to access this information. So we're using this common metadata store, but we're still having the legacy editor tools. And so um, we still can make a more integrated search and access possible for our end users. Um, but um, for special functions, we are not sure if we can really integrate everything. So we, this may still require extra portals. And um, where we have partner applications like the SESTA EQB or also the DARA system, uh, which are run by partners, we will still have the separate portals to be feed. Um, so we currently have also limited support for the different metadata versions, also the CV versions. And so this is um, part of my conclusions. We really uh, need to establish this metadata store as a central store for all the remaining applications. Um, we will go into uh, editing tools, evaluate them, and we will also look into Dataverse and Collectica, for example, if we can really streamline this workflow here. And so we can really um, also make sure that we can, can have a complete concept for managing also different versions of CVs. And so this means we need to include the change into our concept for all the system. So uh, this is the summary. So we need to manage not only the content and not only the standards, but also the software tools, the workflows and the conversions that we have. And this way we can uh, manage to meet the challenges that I have talked about before. So, and that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, 
while we think you think about uh, questions. Thank you, Wolfgang. It's it's really impressive. Uh, I you mentioned uh, the fact that you you will use the CMM. Uh, and there, if I remember correctly, and you you have additional issues to think of uh, besides the CMM. Did I understand this correctly? I was wondering what are the additional issues. Um, at what point? In um, the when you mentioned the CMM, the SESDA metadata model, uh, which is DDI compliant, and uh, you mentioned, if I understand correctly, maybe I, I didn't, yeah, uh, I that you have uh, additional issues to think of besides the CMM, and I, I was just wondering what are they? Yes, uh, the connection to, to the CMM is um, also using the the controlled vocabularies and i think i refer to the to this version management because currently yeah. in our dbk application for example we have a specific cv that matches the cv that is used by the cmm model but now if that changes for example we have had changes in the sesta topic classification yes. um, uh, we are currently not well prepared to to tackle these issues. We need to go to our application and really do programming and and adding the new version. And this really creates some concern. I think I was referring to this. I understand. Yeah, yeah. I think we have yeah. this too, because yeah, you have to deal with versions and all that. So it's never easy. Uh, as I, I think I cannot see the chat, so I don't see if there are uh, I, for the time being, I think everything was very clear, okay. uh, but if, if nobody has any question, I have a, a second one, uh, because we, we, we are thinking about it too, uh, but by far. Um, also, you mentioned the fact that uh, you are now uh, sharing new data types, if I can mention, if I can speak about it in this way. Uh, for example, from Facebook or Twitter, uh, yes. you have this in your data collection. In fact, I have, I have two questions. Do you, is, is it data that you co collect yourself? Uh, oh no, it's mostly data that, that people contribute um, okay. in our Zuvi Data Metatorium repository. Uh, for example, um, some tweets from the German general election, mm. uh, or also uh, link collections from from um, candidates for election candidates um, and things like that. But sometimes there's also uh, that people from Gezes are doing the research because they're yeah. also active in research and then they use, uh, so to say, their home uh, yeah. service to, to provide it. So there are, there are also uh, Gezes members uh, using the servers, right? Okay, uh, and I was thinking about the legal considerations uh, you have to take into account when you share this type of data. Um, in, is this a major issue uh, or not? Uh, because uh, when we thought about it, I, I, rem I remember that the legal considerations kind of stopped us to do it because maybe in France mm. it's more difficult mm. to do it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, there are two two sides of this. If you look from the service side, um, you can always say, okay, dear researcher, if you deposit something with us, you yeah. must uh, be sure that you have the right to do that, that you need to share it. For example, if somebody shares a text from newspapers, these may be copyrighted so yeah for, uh, or um and the same is true also for for tweets um twitter has a very uh detailed um regulation about what is allowed for sharing and what not and when we get this data we try to look into this but since we are no legal experts we always have to rely also that um the researchers uh, evaluate that themselves, but this is part of the of a kind of checklist that we do. Mm. Is it 
um, is it acceptable to to accept this data and for for the researchers it's more complicated but because they really must to uh, adhere all the regulations in their field and uh, the laws that applies to their research so um, for them it's sometimes so that they cannot say um, that they thought about this beforehand and sometimes uh, data is not deposited because of these problems yeah i understand thank you um as i um i think everything was very clear as i okay, already said much. so thank you uh we are moving on to our last presentation, a uh, presentation from Ariana Caporali. Uh, Ariana obtained a PhD in demography in, in 2007 and was recruited as research engineer at the survey department of the French Institute for Demographic Studies, INED, uh, in 2011. She's in charge of survey data documentation and macro level contextual databases, especially for the DGP, the Generation and Gender Program, for which she is a member of the Central Coordination Team. Beginning with 2019, uh, she is responsible for the INED Data Lab, a team of seven engineers who carry out data documentation and data dissemination activities at INED. So, Ariana, I see you shared your screen. Yes, <laughs> thanks uh, Alina for the introduction. Um, so, as you said, uh, I wish to say that um, I have a so social science background, so I'm not an IT person. And this is for sure reflected in my, in my work, at, um, in my presentation today. So today, I will report on a study that compares um, three software solutions for the development of a, a DDI-based uh, survey catalog. I will start off with explaining the context of this study. So first, the French Institute for Demographic Studies, INED, uh, the institute where I work, is a public research institute specialized in population studies, structured in research units and supports, support departments. Um, the research at INED focuses on eight main themes related to demography, but also other social sciences. For example, family, mortality, migrations, housing, gender inequalities, aging, etc. INED researchers carry out data collection operations on these teams in collaboration with INED survey department and develop aggregated and contextual databases. In the current context of open data, INED created in 2019 uh, a data lab to strengthen two types of activities. First, the development and maintenance of aggregated and contextual databases. As of today, we have 11 of such databases. And second, the activities about uh, survey data documentation, dissemination and access requests. More in particular, we manage a, a survey catalog based on, on the software Nesta and our surveys can be requested through the data access portal managed by Projet Doque Telediffusion, which is the French data archive. And we also manage uh, the survey catalog of the Generations and Gender Program, DGP. Uh, the study I present today is about looking for our software to replace Nesta. And this is needed because Nesta is being discontinued. And this is something that other, also other institutions are, face, are facing now. So just a few words about our catalogs. They were both launched te about 10 years ago. Here you see uh, the INED Nesta catalog. It includes about 250 entries. And there is heterogeneity in terms of teams and years covered. The oldest survey was carried out in, in the 1940s. The target audience is the largest research community. On the contrary, the target audience for DGP Nesta catalog is mainly the DGP users community. And DGP is a longitudinal panel star surveys, survey uh, carried out in 20 countries in Europe and beyond on family and life course trajectories. 
uh, to choose, uh, in order to choose a substitute for Nestar, we carry out a four-step study. First, we identify the characteristics the new tool should meet. Second, we identify possible tools that we can test. Second, third, we evaluate the selected tools against a set of key characteristics. And fourth, we implement and test the tools. This last uh, uh, step has only been partially accomplished so far. In the next slides, I will show the outcomes of each of these four steps. So as to the first uh, step, the looked for characteristics, for us, the new tool should be compatible with the Data Documentation Initiative DDI standard, and this is a guarantee of good metadata, the data discovery, and data reusability. It should be harvestable by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives, so SESDA catalog. For e service only, it should be compatible with the Ketele Procedure Diffusion Data Portal, knowing that a new portal is going to be developed. It should also target, um, allow to target the largest scientific community. It should be installable on e servers, maintain the strengths of Nestar, and improve, improve its weaknesses. As to the last two points, uh, among Nestar features that we, we would like to maintain, there are the, its compatibility, compatibility with DDI, uh, some of its functionalities, such as visualization of meta metadata about fieldworks, as well as variable tabulation and, gra and graphs, uh, and the data analysis functionalities, uh, such as linear regressions and cross tabulations. It is also good that it comes with a uh, Nesta publisher, so a user-friendly DDI files editor. Among the features, uh, that, uh, the Nesta features that we would like to improve, the outdated technology, uh, which implies risk of security breaches, uh, a poor search functionality, and in general, Nesta interface is more suitable for a specialized research community, such as statisticians. As to the second step uh, of our study, we knew about four tools, Microdata.0, uh, which is developed by the Religious Center for Research Data, um, Dataverts, supported by uh, Harvard University and CESDA, NADA, uh, Microdata Cataloging Tool, the International, uh, which is developed by the International Household Survey Research Network, and Co Collectica Portal. Since Microdata uh, Point and o, uh, is not open for reuse, we focused only on Dataverse, NADA, and Collectica Portal. In the next slides, I will show the advantages and disadvantages of each of these tools and evaluate them against uh, our uh, set, chosen set of characteristics. <clears throat> so Dataverse, among the advantages of Dataverse, it is compliant, uh, it is DDI compliant, it is open source tool, supported by SESDA, as I said already. It has a user-friendly interface and search functionality. It is considered for implementation by the French archive. And with an external tool, it is possible to visualize um, variable, variable distribution. Among the disadvantages of Nesta for us, the basic version uh, needs to be customized so it needs to be, it, it needs a well-established IT infrastructure. It does not allow for data analysis and it does not come with a DDI files editor, such as Nesta Publisher, to document, at least to document the variable level me metadata. And additionally, uh, uh, it requires resources to upgrade the DDI version of our existing DDI files to the version 2.5, which is the one used in, by Dataverse. So to give, to give scores to Dataverse based on our set uh, of uh, key characteristics, it is good because it is DDI compliant, it is harvestable by SESTA catalog, com uh, um, it, it, uh, it, is, it, is, um, it allows to target the largest research community, 
thanks to uh, its uh, user-friendly inter interface. It improves the weaknesses of Nestor, uh, but um, we, don't, we don't know whether it will be compatible with the Ketelet Procedure Diffusion Data Portal. Uh, we don't know whether it will be uh, installable on the servers, and it only uh, keeps uh, uh, some of the strengths of Nestor. It does not allow for data analysis online. So for those that are not familiar with uh, Dataverse, here you have uh, an example. This is the installation at Sciences Po, and Dataverse is used already uh, by uh, 59 archives, uh, which is also a guarantee of high uh, quality um, software. Moving to NADA, among its advantages, it is TTI compliant, free of charges. It is already installed at TNED in the framework of an international project. Um, it, it allows for visualization of variable distributions. It has a user-friendly interface and search functionality. And uh, it is compatible with, with the Nestor DDI uh, version. Uh, among uh, its disadvantages, it does not have a, a data uh, analysis uh, functionality and it does not come with a DDI files editor. So NADA users uh, use Nesta Publisher to edit the, the DDI files. So for us, NADA is good because it is compatible with DDI. It allows to target the largest scientific community. It is installable on inner servers. It improves uh, the weaknesses of Nesta, but we still have to figure out whether it is harvestable by CESDA catalog, uh, it, uh, compatible with the KTLA, with the choice uh, that will be uh, made by KTLA Procedure Diffusion, and it does not uh, allow for data analysis online. So on the left, you can see um, an example of NADA, the one uh, installed at TNED. It was installed in um, the framework of a project called DemoStaff in collaboration with the uh, statistical offices in Africa. And on the right of the screen, you have a, a, a GGP variable view in NADA, and this is the result of a test we have done at TNED. So you can see the variable metadata as well as the variable uh, distribution. Moving to Collectica portal, among the, the advantages of uh, Collectica, uh, it is compatible with DDI 3.2, and this allows for comparisons of variables. In particular, uh, this is uh, interesting for longitudinal surveys uh, like GGP, because we can compare variables over time. Uh, Additionally, it comes with DDI file, files editor called Collectica Designer, which, is, uh, which has interesting features for GGP because it allows to convert BLAZ files to DDI. And BLAZ is the software that is used by most of GGP countries for their data collection. Uh, it can be installed on local server as well as uh, on a cloud it allows to browse variable distributions and it offers training workshops. Among the disadvantages of uh, Collectica, it is a commercial product. Uh, it has uh, features that are not necessarily uh, uh, strictly necessary for simple surveys and resources are needed uh, to take advantage of DDI 3.2 to connect variables and uh, that can be compared, and uh, it does not allow uh, to, uh, and it also necessary, resources are also necessary to upgrade uh, the DDI uh, files coming from Nesta, and it does not allow uh, for data analysis online. So compared to our, our set of characteristics, Collectica is good because it is compatible with DDI, harvestable by CESDA catalog, well, at least the uh, Euro Question Bank. It improves uh, Nest, the weaknesses of Nesta, but uh, 
it is, it is probably more suitable for a specialized public. Uh, we don't know whether it will, can be installed on yet servers. So far, we tested the uh, cloud-hosted solution. We don't know whether it will be compatible with the Ketele uh, Procedure Diffusion Data Portal, and uh, it only maintains part of the strengths of Nestar. So here you have a view of a GGP variable description. Uh, the test, uh, one of the a screenshot we took uh, during our test in the cloud hosted solution. And also below, uh, you can see uh, the view of a comparison between two variables uh, uh, from, 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 from the GGP survey uh, about having uh, uh, relationships without cohabitation. Uh, and this is a comparison of two variables uh, of between uh, two variables of two different ways. And this is possible thanks to DDI 3.2 and Collectica portal. As to the last step of uh, the study, we expect to test Dataverse next year. Now that we uh, already tested it, we need to figure out whether it is harvestable by other data catalogs. Collectica designer, uh, the test is ongoing and with good result, very good results for GGP, as well as the portal, we will, uh, we will have to see whether it is um, installable on, in a, uh, on our server. So to conclude, so uh, the first conclusion is that there is no perfect substitute for Nestar. in a survey catalog will be based on data versus NADA. This is still uh, unsolved. We will use a different tool for GGP, and this, it is uh, likely, very likely, that we will use uh, Collectica. And uh, in general, to answer the question, what criteria should guide the choice of a software for a DDI-based survey catalog? I would say mainly contextual subjective uh, uh, criteria. It depends on the available resources, uh, the institute IT infrastructure, the target audience, and also uh, whether uh, there are specific needs, which may be different for longitudinal surveys. And this is it. Thank you, Ariana. Uh, I thought um, we had a comment, uh, but I think it's uh, from Genevieve to, uh, to Taina. Uh, if you want to ask a question, it's your uh, chance now, please. And uh, while you think about it, because I see nothing for the time being in the Q&A uh, section, I have a question for you, Ariana. Uh, you said that NADA is compatible with uh, DDI. Uh, I was wondering which version of DDI. About the, uh, I think it's the Nestor version because I, okay. the point, 1.2. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. I see a question now uh, from Wolfgang. Uh, he's asking, so if you will be using Collectica, do you need another tool for a catalog? Uh, yes, as I said, uh, it might be too much work to adapt uh, uh, in the uh, DDI files to Collectica for all the surveys. Um, so for the moment, we are focusing on GGP because uh, the advantages of uh, using Collectica for GGP is quite uh, straightforward. <laughs> yeah, so you, you're sure that you're using Collectica for GGP but not for the other studies, GGP if I understand GGP, yeah. correctly? I cannot be 100% sure because we have uh, not purchased it yet, but uh, we are testing. Yeah. We have already the license for designer and I will do my best to force you to continue this uh, yeah. 
And I see another comment. I, want, I just want to make sure I am not missing anything. Yeah, I see another comment in the chat about NADA. So the next version of NADA accommodates data metadata of multiple types, uh, micro data with DDI 2.5, geospatial, uh, using ISO standards, it includes a metadata editor, uh, provides a metadata API, uh, guidelines for Python users. I'm not going to read it all, but maybe mm -hmm. I'll, I'll copy it in the, uh, if it's okay with you, in the um, Discord channel uh, so that the information doesn't get lost. But thank you, uh, thank you for the comment. Yeah, I, I was aware about the develop, development of a, a file editor. Uh, from NADA, but uh, I didn't, uh, I, I, I mean, I was told, so it was not, I didn't have documentation to put it in the slide. Uh, but okay. yeah, I think it's a nice project to NADA as well. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a, a very complete tool. Um, so I see no more questions. Uh, we are 10 minutes late. Uh, sorry about that, but if you have the time, um, before saying goodbye, I really encourage you to uh, to go on the Discord channel. Uh, as Thomas said this morning, if we, we were in a conference room now, uh, I would have encouraged you to upload all the three presenters, uh, but we can't. It would be really strange on Zoom, but thank you uh, to... Um, everybody uh, it was uh, very interesting and uh, yeah i encourage you to, to to go on discord and continue the the discussion thank you for being here and uh, i guess uh, we are expecting you at edit 2020 in real paris <laughs>